Marshall and Megan Dostal are certainly a dynamic duo. As owners and operators of further products, their story is one where they somewhat fell into their company. Their soaps originated from byproducts of the biofuel Marshall was using to power his Mercedes several years ago. A connection with another particular professional gave rise to their signature scent, something I randomly took note of when washing my hands in the bathroom of one of my favorite restaurants in Los Angeles, Osteria Moza. Really, it was more or less a domino effect that created their company, including a move from New York City to L.A. nearly 20 years ago. My favorite takeaway here is they're a tiny team doing big business. I love their story as well as their products, but I'll let them tell it. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. Marshall, Megan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. This is uh, a Standard Age podcast first. I've not interviewed two people at once, so this will be fun. Oh, and a married couple at that. Yeah. Pretty good. (laughs) Well, cool. Well, um, Megan, you and I were just talking a moment ago about you being from Point Loma. Marshall, where are you from? I'm originally from Darien, Connecticut. So that's a, a suburban town about 45 minutes northeast of New York City. So you mentioned that you guys are married. How did you guys meet then? We met uh, in New York City uh, about 24 years ago, 24 years ago. Uh, Megan worked with some friends of mine at an ad agency. It was her first job and uh, friends that I grew up with. So uh, that's how we met. That's awesome. So you basically met through mutual friends then? Yeah, met through mutual Now, were you working in the city as well? Yes, I was working in the city. What did you do? I was working at a post-production facility, so we edited TV commercials and TV shows. So I was in, uh, it was, it started off as a small company, and so we were all, there was a lot of different things to do, so it was kind of, um, you know, you could, or you had to do lots of different stuff. So assistant editing, sales, uh, customer um, customer support, uh, client support, whatever, like lots a, of different account things. management so type stuff. Just, yeah, tons of different stuff. So, uh, it was kind of learning, you know, whatever, just how the whole business worked. Cause I'd never been part of that business. Sure. And since you're holding the microphone, we'll just start with you in Connecticut. What, what did your folks do? My dad was a, uh, uh, paper salesman. So, uh, Back in the day, people used a lot more paper than they do now, so <laughs> that was uh, that was a pretty good business. I, I mean, there's you know certain things, but not as many newspapers and magazines anymore. So, um, or catalogs, or you know, people would today now obviously people sell their stuff mostly online, but back in the day you'd sell it through catalogs or um, that that you know that approach doesn't really exist anymore. So. Um, there's still paper salesmen, but not as many of them. Now, when you grew up, what were you doing mostly? Were you into sports or were you into... Yes, mostly sports, uh, but a, a bunch of different stuff. I wrote for the newspaper, but loved sports. So played football and hockey and baseball and golf and um, yeah, lots and lots of sports, but wrote uh, in the newspaper, uh, wasn't into theater or music or anything like that. Sure. Um, yeah, so So then what to where did you go for university? I went to Colby College in Waterville, Maine. Okay. How was that how did that treat you? It was good. It was fun. Met a lot of lifelong friends there. Um small liberal arts college. Uh so a very small class, about two thousand less than two thousand people. Sure. Um, and what was your course of study? Uh my major was English. Okay. So you know, mostly just reading books and it's uh, writing, you know, term papers. Whereas joke, like, oh, it's 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 my number one language. It's it's uh, it's what I'm best at. <laughs> well, Megan, let's switch over to you then. What childhood? What what did your folks do? Um, my father is an attorney, and my mom uh, taught for thirty years. What she teach? She taught third grade. Oh, cool. In San Diego, Miss Trexler. That was my third All grade right. teacher. All uh, right. Yeah, she, Mrs. Steelman. So she taught. Um, kids all over San Diego and now she's retired. Okay. So what took you to New York originally? Did you go for school or? No, I went to the University of Arizona and I majored in journalism. 
But when I was nine, I told my mom and my dad that when I was an adult, I was going to move to New York and work at Vogue magazine. And so I moved to New York right after graduation, and I was an assistant media planner, and then I got a job um, at Bulgari. Um, I did all their national advertising, oh, wow. their watches and jewelry. Um, and then I moved to Rolling Stone magazine, town and country, and then I ended up at Vogue. No kidding. So, uh, yeah. And so I met Marshall at my first, during my first job when I was in the media planner. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I did that. And then in 2001, uh, Marshall and I moved to California. And where yeah. were you guys living in the city? We, uh, well, I old fashioned girl that I am. I lived on Waverly place, um, in the West village and Marshall had a home in Chelsea on 15th street. And then once we got engaged, I moved in. <laughs> My best friend used to work, uh, in Chelsea on 15th street. I guess now it's the Google building. Do you know where that is? I think it's, 15th it's right across the street from the apartment. Or something like that. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. I always talk about that apartment. I'm like, God, I wish we had it. But then we do the math and we're like, okay, if we didn't sell that, we couldn't have bought our house. And then if we didn't sell that house, we couldn't have started further. So it's a good thing we don't have that apartment, but it was awesome. Yeah, that's great. Right. So in 2001, you come to California. Yeah. LA specific. Yeah. Okay. The Beachwood Canyon. Now that was because you got sick of the winters or? No, what? we... um. Marshall had an opportunity to write for a show out here. At that point, he was like writing, you know, his English degree was coming out. And um, he had an opportunity to write for a show. And we thought it'd be fun for a year. We were getting married that year in San Juan Capistrano at the Mission. So we thought, oh, we'll come out for a year. So we sublet the apartment. And um, the show was about firemen. So we had plans to move September 13th, 2001. And the show was canceled on September 12th. Of course. Understood. Um, yeah. So we still moved. Um, and Marshall did his writing and I worked. Um, I tried to like, you know, take a turn like, okay, I've been at Vogue. I've done all this crazy stuff. I'm going to work at City of Hope Cancer Center and do cause marketing and, you know, make money for good. Um, and that was great. And then it was time to start a family. Right? Yeah. And... We sold our house. Well, so our son, Wyatt, was adopted. And so I, we wanted to focus on our family. So I stopped working. We hadn't adopted him yet. But I was like, okay, if I'm a, you know, if I'm somebody who's looking to place their child, I was like, let's just create this, you know, perfect situation. So I stopped working. And um, like three months later, Wyatt was born. And then about six months after that, I, I started freelancing for Vogue. <laughs> I was oh, like, wow. I'm not really a, stay at I'm home. not a stay at home. Yeah. Um, so we did that for a long time. And then Marshall bought her, a, had a, we had a diesel car and that's when it all began. Now what car was that? He had a diesel Mercedes and he was making biodiesel. So the biodiesel came long before further. Yeah. Okay. He was just making it. Nice. And, um, I mean, just making it, he built the processor, he was collecting the grease, doing all that. And, um, one day I was in the garage and it was just, there's glycerin everywhere in these, um, plastic containers. And I told him to get rid of it. And he said, no, I'm, I think I can teach myself how to make soap. And he did, but I didn't like it. So it totally worked perfectly well, but it didn't smell good or look good or feel good. Kind of, it didn't really. Was it too like it, viscous or? It was, um, cloudy. It didn't have any scent, um, but it worked technically. I mean, right. it was soap. Right. So then I started playing around with fragrances and he started to perfect. I mean, he was making it on a um, hot plate in the garage. And um, we finally perfected it and some friends were over and they used it. And they're like, you guys should try selling this. So um, it was 10 years ago in September when we incorporated further. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So let's rewind to the car. Marshall, yeah. if that's okay. What year Mercedes was this? Uh, it was a 1984. Um, Wagon? Turbo diesel. Uh, no, four-door, so sedan. Um, and it was actually, it was kind of when we first bought it, it was still when the internet was relatively kind of, it wasn't, 
you know, I, I, it wasn't like the dark ages of the internet. There was stuff, but the, the auto listings weren't all that great. Sure. So I went um, to a place where, um, somewhere I think it was in mid-city or something, and there was this really nice Israeli guy, and he had a, uh, I thought he was selling a two-door um, gas Mercedes or, you know, whatever, regular unleaded uh, Mercedes, but it turned out it was a four-door diesel Mercedes, and it was the same car that my dad had, um, which is actually outside back there. Um, yeah, we have my dad's now. Um, so you have two? No, that's the, 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 the original one that we started on, we... Yeah. yeah, well, well we, uh, I think we gave it to some guy because he <laughs> gave it to somebody because they needed it. But it was in, it, we had, you know, used it quite a bit and it wasn't in the greatest of shape. Um, but yeah, that was the car that we originally got. And then that was three or four years before we started further, maybe. And I had started originally running it on vegetable oil, not biodiesel. Um, and this was something you just researched through the internet? You know, I just saw, uh, read a story online or something about people running their cars on vegetable oil. Um, and I was blown away by it. I couldn't believe that people were doing that. It just seemed like a cool thing. Um, I had no clue that that's, that was possible. And then, so ran it on vegetable oil for a while, but that's a little bit of a complicated process. You can get away with it mostly in Southern California because it's so warm down here but theoretically you're supposed to build a separate tank and put start the car on regular diesel or biodiesel and then heat the vegetable oil up because it gets kind of thick you know room temperature vegetable oil isn't doesn't have sort of a watery property the way gas does um or diesel so uh anyway it just was a little bit of a complicated process and the car sometimes stalls and all sorts of issues so started hearing about biodiesel and then started making that. Um, now, where were you going initially to get the oil? Just local restaurants. Any um, particular type or was it like fast food spots? Or no, like um, whoever just, whoever was willing to give their grease, just trying to think of some of the, before we started working with some of the bigger restaurants, it was just, we were living in Highland Park. So, and then, close to, so Pasadena, I think we went to, um, Smith Brothers, whatever that place is called, the Royal Chop House, I would get it from a bunch and different places like that. So then, so is glycerin a byproduct of that process? Like how did the glycerin come about specifically? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a byproduct. So when you make biodiesel, you take vegetable oil and you add methanol and either sodium or potassium hydroxide to it. So that's lye. Um, I always tell people it's like in the, in the well, no, it's in like in Fight Club, you know. That yeah, the lye where, soap. Yeah, where but where he pours the lye on his hand and yeah. burns his hand or whatever. Uh, Brad Pitt does that to Ed Norton, so that's lye. So lye is used um, to make biodiesel. You add uh, methanol to vegetable oil and then the sodium or potassium hydroxide, and then you get when you make that you get um, biodiesel, and then you get a glycerin byproduct. So you get, they call them methyl esters, which is the, that's the biodiesel. And then the glycerin is the, uh, the byproduct. So, so you is, get, sorry, is it, so is it like uh, oil and water where you just scrape it off the top, like, you know, organic peanut butter kind of thing? And you yeah, just take um, it? a little different because the, the glycerin is heavier. So that so it's on the bottom, sinks to the bottom. And then, and the percentage is about, you get about 15, 20% glycerin, 80% biodiesel when you make a batch so if you had 100 gallons about 20 gallons of it would be glycerin glycerol because there's still a little bit of methanol in it you got to take that out and then you can purify the glycerin sure well not to get too much in those weeds but yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm a sucker for details so. no no it's uh <laughs> yeah and that stuff started piling up in the in the garage and um needed to get rid of it and which reached a tipping point for megan to get rid of it yeah it was sort of and it was one of those things where kind of oh well it seems like got to be something you can do with this because it's sort of a waste to trying to reuse stuff so what can you do with this and so soap came about mm -hmm. now megan i'll let you touch on the olfactory yeah. aspect so I've never made perfume. I've never made candles. I've never made anything like that. I mm -hmm. just, 
the way I envision it is just this big white lab that you go in and just start smelling things and then grab the essential oil number 14 or something. So like. that's how like professionals do it. Yeah. So how did this so come about scent wise? Cause when, I love the scent. Oh, thank you. So, um, initially we, I honestly just ordered scents online and then mixed them. And I mean, we had no idea what we were doing and somebody heard about our soap. They heard what we were, what we were trying to do. And, um, you know, you can kind of like get away with a lot when you're like a husband and wife trying to start a business and people get real charmed real quick. So this person heard about us and, um, and they were actually like a very well regarded and talented nose. So they're professional scent creator. And so, um, this person for free developed our scent, which is bergamot, olive and grass. Yeah. it's awesome. So, um, that normally is, tens of thousands of dollars multiplied to have somebody create you a scent like that. So, um, but since then we've definitely become much more tuned, tuned to what we like and we don't like powder. We don't like flowers. We like that it's unisex. So, um, we're getting better at developing future scents on our own. Um, cause now, I mean, we smell everything now. Especially when we go to restaurants, we're like always coming out of the so the restroom like, oh, their soap smells this way or that way. Um, That's so funny because for it's whatever further. reason, I've always done that. Uh -huh. like, I have zero reason as yeah. to why I've done it, but it's just. Yeah, it wasn't ever my thing. But um, I mean, now our son will come out and be like, oh, their soap is so gross. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so that's how we came about with luck, a lot of luck. And um, yeah, no, we love the scent. It's great. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, I think personally, I feel like the packaging of your products mm -hmm. is really cohesive with kind of maybe just the scent. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But how did you guys go about formulating the packaging and like, how did that come about? Like if you want to describe it a little bit, like right. the so soap bottles. Is we have, um, so our label is craft. I mean, it just, it's, it's, you know, it's craft. Um, it's been craft for 10 years. We're not copying anybody. Um, and it has a really unique font um, that runs down the side. And then the back of our packaging and our candles and everything has our story. Um, and at one point, we were looking at different packaging options. And one was really white and bright and fresh. And then there was, um, and there was all clear bottles. And then we saw these smoky bottles with um, the craft. And it just this the, what we ended up with which is like this for our 16 ounce it's a smoky bottle um for our candles we have like a candle tin but we also have like a highball glass that's um a candle it just felt most like us right you know at one point i was like well these white the white one might look better in like pictures in people's kitchens but we've never really made decisions like that we've made decisions like which one looks like us um like when I, like I, I built our website and like which pictures feel like us, which copy feels like us. So it's, um, that's how we landed on it. It's so, something we would put in our house. So the bottles, uh, for those listening are, are kind of, um, a brownish hue. Would you yeah, say? Yeah, they're, a, they're, we have a soap and a lotion. So the lotion is a clear, um, and then there's amber at eight ounce and then our 16 ounce, they're both like a smoky gray okay. with the brown label yeah, and then the label is almost like a brown paper bag yeah, type exactly. color yeah. yeah so we kind of wanted something that would look good anywhere now did you source all that from outside of la or were you able to find these for like your samples for example like how did you go about finding your packaging i will let marshall answer that <laughs> i'm more like i'm picturing this and I've, i would like this and then he does that yeah he does the work <laughs> so Megan has the vision and then Marshall, you basically yes, exactly. do the yeah, research. Exactly. Get it. Uh, so, um, yeah, the bottles are unique looking. So we, uh, had to source those or source those. They're still in the U S but they're made in, um, in Ohio. Okay. Um, and then the Amber, so the, those are the 16 ounce bottles. Um, cause there's only kind of one place that can make them. Um, it's there cause they're unique. Um, and then the eight ounce bottles we buy locally here, uh, at a, 
um, bottle supplier, but uh, usually the containers are made uh, in Simi, but sometimes I think if they're running low or something like that, Simi, California, so not too far, then they maybe get them from a different place. They might get them from you know a manufacturer in the Midwest or wherever it's coming from. Now, was the packaging made in the U.S. important to you guys, or is that just how it worked out? Yeah, that, yes, that was very important. So we could get it much less expensively if we did it in China or in Korea or wherever. But yeah, that was important to have it made in the U.S. So when you were saying in Ohio that it's kind of custom, so you had them soup to nuts shaped for you, the 16-ounce bottles? Yeah, they had, um, we didn't get a mold made. The The mold existed, but it's the only one. If you want to, if we wanted to, you know, you could, we could create our own custom mold, but that was sort of out of our price range um, right. But um, at the time. But they made a bottle. This is just the one place that makes it, so. What would a custom bottle cost if you had a to A custom guess? molding? I think that can be upwards of, Gosh, I may I think I may forget, but I think I remember it being, you know, as much as fifty thousand dollars or something like that. So Yeah, that's steep. Yeah. Wow. You have to just to build the, the mold. It may be less. I, I may be I just remember at the time it being a a number where you went, Whoa, that's a lot of money. Yeah. So early days distribution, who were you guys approaching or like how, how were you guys selling this stuff, say year one? Early on we uh our first thing is we did, we were kind of, we went to a trade, well, did we go to the trade show first or were we selling to, to restaurants? We sold to a couple of restaurants, didn't we? Uh, the idea was that we, um, you know, made this product and had a, finally after a while of going, Megan and I working together and going back and forth, we we came up with a, a product that was good that we thought, um, and there was a lot of trial and error, and... Uh, but we thought kind of immediately that, oh, wow, this would make a lot of sense if we sold it to restaurants because we're getting grease from restaurants. So they use soap and why not sell it back to them? So that's kind of originally how we started. And then from there, we went to a trade show and um, figured out that maybe there'd be some, some besides restaurants, there'd be some retail stores that would like to sell it as well. And that was the gift show in New York City? Um, no, this one was in L.A. Okay. Um, at the convention center. Gotcha. It was a long time ago, yeah. And uh, I discovered you guys out of a restaurant. Yeah. It was uh, Osteria Moza. Yeah, yeah. Are they still using you guys? Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's one of my favorite restaurants in L.A. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice one. doesn't hurt that it's not terribly far away either. Right, right. Um. Well, that's great. So then early days as you're selling to these restaurants or and or wholesale accounts, I guess, right? Like as far as a business structure goes, were you just reinvesting in the company to grow it or has that always been the case? Yeah, we were. Uh, yeah, definitely. We were, you know, at first we were kind of in the first year or so, maybe even a little bit longer thinking that we'll just try this out and see if it works. It wasn't I mean, we were spending full-time hours, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a... Well, yeah, I guess it was a full-time effort. I mean, we were spending a lot of time, but we weren't ever 100% sure that it was going to work. And we thought, we'll give it a shot, see if we can turn it into a business. And if we can, we will and keep it going. But if for some reason it doesn't make sense or people don't like it or, you know, we can't turn this into a business, um, we'll call it quits. But And meanwhile, you're both still writing and contributing freelance? No. This, oh, oh, during the, um, no, I was, I was, uh, I was pretty much devoting, we had saved up a bunch of money, um, after we sold our house. So we had a little bit of a runway and, um, so I was pretty much working on it full time. And I was not, I was still freelancing, um, with the, their events. So I would travel um per- per- periodically and i don't think i was f- i mean i think i think when we incorporated so that was 10 years ago is when i started working for it like that was more my focus so it's pretty soon like you guys were just full-fledged into it yeah i mean i remember telling marshall like if we could sell this at fred siegel then i think we got something because they're like i mean this was 10 years ago like they're like the opinion makers in la and that's where other people go to shop for their shops so we sent them some some bottles of soap, and they sent us a letter like "thank you," but no, no, thank you. And um, 
I remember thinking like, oh, at least we tried. And like a month or two later, they called Marshall like, oh, we've been seeing you guys all over L.A. at different restaurants. Like we'd love to carry you. So um, it was shortly after that that it was like, OK, let's let's focus. That's you know? really interesting. Yeah. So they felt like they were missing an opportunity. Yeah. And we have a ton of people who restaurants because, you know, chefs eat at other chefs restaurants. So people, you know, or chef or restaurant managers or whomever, you know, oh, I saw you here and there and we want you at our new location. So, and these people all leave the restroom smelling their hands too, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. And <laughs> some of chefs. our restaurants actually sell the soap and the candles and the lotion because so many people like it. Oh, no and kidding. So it's, yeah. It's great. That's um, awesome. So yeah, so that's, and then I think it was when we moved here to South Pasadena is when we got the warehouse in the office and that was eight or nine years ago. No, eight years ago. Our son is in seventh, eighth grade. It was eight years ago um, that we made the split from the living room. You know, it, it started in an extra bedroom then it took over the living room that took over the whole house. And so now um, we've got a warehouse and a office and all that awesome. in El Sereno, California. This week's episode is brought to you by Passion Fine Jewelry, located in Solana Beach, California, where owners Jana and Tim Jackson welcome you into their living room-like store, carrying a wide range of independent watches and variety of fine jewelry. Tim is GIA certified, and they also have a goldsmith in-house as part of their staff. Visit passionfinejewelry.com for more information, and if you're ever in Southern California, please make it a point to visit the store. You can also find a wealth of information via Tim's blog, independentintime.com. Of course, this is also brought to you by Standard H. Standard H.com is where you'll find our online shop providing branded merchandise to support the podcast. And if you subscribe to our email list, you'll be one of the many insiders receiving exclusive special offers. Now back to my conversation with Marshall and Megan. So structurally then, how many employees are there? Is it still just family? It's us and we have um, Lorenzo who helps us in our warehouse. Um, We uh, don't make the soap ourselves anymore. So we have uh, manufacturers who make it and a lot of it gets made and then shipped out of there. So uh, fortunately, they have bigger, you know, they've one company has probably 100 people that work there and the other company has about 150 people that work there. So they're big operations that we do business with that we provide them with the ingredients. So it just makes it easier from a logistics standpoint and makes it um, running the business easier because, um, you know, those companies have obviously much more overhead and much more um, things to worry about. So. Um, so how did you go about that. finding that manufacturer or those manufacturers? Is that simply a Google search as well? Or is yeah, it, it was or? A, li- a little bit of everything, just kind of asking around and yeah, Google searches and just trying to figure out the right fit. Um, and those are local? Yes. Uh, oh, cool. One of them is in Glendale and the other one is in Chino. Right. So super close. Yes. Yeah, that's great. And so Lin- Lorenzo does primarily packaging or shipping, yeah. shipping and handling. Exactly. Both in and out, I guess. Yeah. That's great. So as far as like the growth of the company, you said you're working on some new scents. What, uh, what can we expect or is that not shareable yet? Well, we have some, uh, some things that we sell, some items that we sell at Sprouts, um, lotions, uh, that have a geranium, amber, lime fragrance and a lavender, coriander, pine. And, um, yeah, so we sell those there and then, um, but that's just specifically at Sprout, so we don't sell that online or anything like that. Um, we just sell it at that market. Um, so did they approach you guys about doing something specific for them? No, or? it's still the further brand, but yeah, they want we wanted to try you know try that out and the grocery see how you know things could work at the grocery world, and that's uh, the, the grocery world is a little is obviously different from um, standard retail, standard retail and supplying to them and. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, different ways of selling. Like a a lot of people sell their stuff just exclusively on online now and do very well that way. So I think the world has changed a little bit. I mean, there's still obviously traditional retail and grocery and all that stuff, but 
we see a lot of growth online too, which is exciting because we feel like we can connect with people. Megan does a lot of work with, you know, doing our social media, Instagram and that sort of thing. And it's just always fun to see people find you online because it's not always, you know, just being on the shelf is great, but where are you placed on the shelf? And, you know, it's hard to compete with the, you know, the Burt's Bees or the Mrs. Myers of the world because they've got such bigger budgets and they're able to do a lot more in terms of, buy, you know, ad dollars and all that stuff. So um, so you, would you com- consider those two basically your main competitors then? Um, I don't know. What do you think? Or is that man? not much of a thought? Um, so there's no one else in the, in the world doing the production process that we're doing. So, um, as far as like retailers that are, you know, more the smaller retailers who love having products that tell a story, we don't really have competition. We had a meeting, um, last week with a company who is looking at a lot of different, um, uh, personal care brands and they're looking at Aesop and they're looking at, um, melon and gets they're looking at further so um you know i think that we our price is pretty it's higher than you know most um it's higher than birds bees it's 17 dollars for a 16 ounce soap um but you can also go online and find a 50 dollar 16 ounce soap so people say, will pay every Aesop's you know like 40 it's, or 50, yeah it's a it? lot so um we wanted it to be something that you might buy for yourself, but you'd also feel comfortable giving as a gift to somebody. Um, and that's where we landed on our pricing and based on, you know, the quality of everything that we use. Uh, it's a, I mean, for me, I'm always like, Oh my God, I think, I think it's sometimes I'm like, that's a lot. Like when you go to the grocery store, but then when you go to a gift store, it's slow. So it's oh, you kind meant of that funny, about yourself? Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm like, because when you go to the grocery store, you're like, God, some of those things are three dollars. Like, where are they making that? And clearly, they're making it outside of the country and millions of bottles. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, but you know, I'm happy with our price, and I'm happy that we can drive right now to the manufacturer, and we know him, and we can walk through the property. You know, it's yeah. There's a value to that. Absolutely. So, yeah. So to answer your question, not really. We don't really see ourselves having a competition. Um, we work with enormous, um, we work with the Irvine company. We provide soap to all of their office buildings. They're the largest, um, lessee in the state of California, like millions and millions of square feet. So we, and we provide the, all the soap for the Microsoft campus up in Redmond. But then we also work with, you know, Odium, like a beautiful restaurant in downtown LA. We work with Moza. We work with Bestia, like all these great restaurants in LA, but also in Chicago and San Francisco and New York. So um, I think most people sort of like our story and they like being able to tell um, their, whatever it is, either their, um, their occupants or their diners or their shoppers, their, their, um, that they're carrying a product that has more than just, you know, a cute package. Yeah, sure. And I'm sure their employees end up asking about it too. Yeah. I mean, my dad, his old job, it was in, um, it was in an Irvine company building and he was sending me photos. He's like, they made these things in every single bathroom. They produced these counter cards. So people knew about our soap and up at the Microsoft campus, they created enormous signage. So their employees could figure out like, Oh, our grease from our cafeteria is being recycled and the glycerin is being used to make our hand soap. Um, so there is a value to that. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So what has been sort of the hardest part about the business in you guys' opinion, be it one or different opinions? I mean, like silly things. I mean, it's been so long now, I don't even think about it. But when we first started, it was like, I always worked for major corporations. Like we had an HR person and we had, you know, staples that just came out of a closet and paper just came out of a closet and there was an IT person. So it, you know, when you first start, you're doing everything and we still are, but now it's normal and we see the value in it. But I think when you first start out, you forget that you don't, you're, you are in charge of everything. Right. Yes. I agree with that hundred percent. Uh, yeah. The hardest thing, uh, you know, with just the ups and downs of any kind of, I think Megan's point is, is, it's just right. You know, when you're, when you own your own small business, you're responsible for everything. So, you know, there's obviously 
good days, but bad days too. And bad days, you can't necessarily just kind of walk away and go, all right, I'm going home, whatever, you know, just, you got to make sure that everything's still running and running properly. And so there's, there's definitely a lot of highs and definitely a lot of lows, but overall it's, it's very rewarding to, you know, to feel like you started something and you have something that, that, uh, you know, a, a product that people like and enjoy and then, but it's also a business. So you, you like the fact that people buy it and keep coming back. Sure. So then on the easy side, what's been easy for you? Nothing. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> Do you have an answer? I don't know what's been easy. Okay. Here. Working with Megan is very easy. All right. Uh, I think that because we've been doing it for so long, we don't, we forget how nice it is. Marshall has coached Wyatt's baseball when he played for six years. He, he now plays lacrosse where he's able to go and take him to practice and watch his games. And, you know, we have so many friends who, um, husbands and wives travel all the time for work and they miss so much or they're working late or, you know, we, um, are able to volunteer a ton. We're able to be very present, um, so we'll, I mean, we will never look back on our child's life and think, oh shoot, you know, I wish I, I I'm sorry I missed that. Um, he'll probably wish like oh, my freaking parents were around all the time, <laughs> but for us selfishly, that has been the easy part. Um, I think we've grown slower than we could have. If I was 31 when we start, no, 10 years, how old am I? 44, 34 when we started. A little, I mean, I was probably 32 when we started and then whatever. But um, I think if I was 22, we probably would have like spent all of our money and burned the midnight oil and slept on sofas. And, but when we had, we had a family when we started the business. So it's just been a much slower growth, but what we've reaped has been more than financial. So it's been worth it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's pros and cons. I think that might make it a more manageable just along the way right. too, you know, so you're not feeling like you're in over your yeah. head in any aspect. And we've had opportunities from enormous retailers, but the risk, um, I mean, the reward could be amazing, but it's, uh, the risk is enormous and we own further. And so we're not really re willing to put it all and we can't risk everything because we have a family and we have, you know, we're not going to sleep on someone's sofa. <laughs> too old <laughs> so you mentioned fred siegel early days as like kind of a dream vendor is there anybody currently or is there like a level of distribution that you're shooting for like what i think right now we're we're thinking like i mean literally everybody needs soap everywhere so um there's a couple really big um restaurant groups that i love to eat at and so it's kind of like it's always it's always like very personal like I love all these restaurants I we should be in those restaurants so there's a there's things like that there's um you know like hospitality is enormous and we're sort of breaking into that we're in a few hotels but that is endless possibility um what what are some of the hotels so people can go see you um I just so we're at the Fairmont in Santa Monica awesome um, Ohio Valley Inn and oh, Spa yes. Um, I just saw a post today. Someone tagged us in at the SCP hotel in Colorado. Um, and we do, you know, all of their amenities. Um, where? Oh, this great new place called, uh, the Kuyama Buckhorn, um, which is up off the five in central. I think it's like far west, far east Santa Barbara County. So it's, I mean, it's mountain country, um, cattle country, but it's beautiful. Um, but yeah, I mean, not like Hilton hotel properties nationwide, but, um, you know, we're sort of positioning ourselves for something big like that, you know? Um, but we're so small and we're the ones that are trying to get those meetings. So, you know, so it takes, it takes some time. So when you say you're positioning yourself for that kind of business, is it more about the meeting or is it more about the back end? It's the back end. Like Marshall has been very mindful of every step along the way, being able to do something that can be um, like scale. He's very invested in someone being able to place an order of any size and we can meet it based on his relationships with our vendors. Um, 
And so that's huge because when you go in as a small camp company and someone's like, oh, I wanted to place it, you know, I'm interested in this. Can you fill that? Like, yes, we can fill it. Yeah, that's great. Has right? there been... Oh, go ahead, Marshall. Yeah. Yeah, scale's not an issue. Um, so, yeah, we can scale to any size. Um, uh, yeah, so we're just sort of waiting for the right... I mean, there's different things that we really kind of like the business-to-business -business elements, so the restaurants and the office buildings and that kind of thing because hotels, whatever, because um, it's there's no returns or anything like that. People just use the soap. So retail, if you get into selling at a Target or a Walmart or something like that, you've really got to know your game. And, you know, they're expecting, um, they're expecting, you know, you we could scale to it, but you've got to, you know, if it doesn't sell, they return the stuff. So that's not really a good way to do business. Right, yeah. No kidding. I'm sure that's a stress unlike any other. Yeah, really. it would just, it's one of those things where, you know, it is our, you know, we're, you know, we're small, but I mean, we're, we sell to a bunch of bigger companies, but when we say small, I mean, there's some companies that sell, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of soap. So we're not there yet. We're hoping one day we will be, but, um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where you, you have to choose your battles wisely. So we don't want to get into a situation where we go, you know, go for business with a certain company and then next thing you know, it didn't work out and know well the company's out of business. So yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's almost sort of in conjunction with growing slow maybe because if you grow too fast then your, your business is so heavily predicated on X vendor and then who knows they could go belly up and then you've lost 90% of your revenue. Exactly. You know, so, so I think that's really smart. Has there been anything necessarily that you had hoped or thought would be successful that ended up failing? Not yet. Um, I mean, we, we don't have tons and tons of SKUs. I mean, we have, you know, everything that we sell sells well and that's why we keep, we keep it around. So, um, have we tried anything? I don't think we've tried any, but again, we haven't, yeah, we're right. No, I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a solid answer. I mean, yeah, we haven't really, I mean, not, it's not saying that as kind of a, oh, whatever we do works. But if you look at our margins, we actually, our margins do very well in every category that we sell, whether it's business to business or you know, online or direct to, you know, direct to consumer or through retail. It's, we've sort of made sure that we know we're making money. I mean, I know there's probably businesses out there where their margins aren't very good, but they sell a ton, but that's a, whole separate company you've got to be ready you got to have you really have to know your your stuff to do that well a random question that i i kind of have uh and it's sort of um you worked for rolling stone so like with bands like you're only as good as your last hit kind of thing right so i i've always thought of like how do you appreciate what you've done while still being motivated to continue doing what you do uh you know, having to pay the bills, I suppose. Um, that's very fair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's one motivating factor. Is if uh, if we don't sell soap, then uh, we don't eat. So right, that's sure. a motivating factor for me, at least. No, but he's talking about appreciating. Oh, appreciating. Yeah, but I don't think we ever do until there's like a third party that set does. Like we're never like, what an amazing week! And like we sold this much soap, and like high five, but. Years ago, there was like, like along the way, there's been like, we were in Inc. Magazine as like a company to watch, and we were here, and we've had we've had meetings with like incredible companies, and we've sold like we've we've hit numbers that when we were starting out never thought we would have happened. But it usually takes somebody else kind of bringing it up where you're like, oh yeah, that is kind of crazy that like two people who never thought they would ever start a company, let alone together, are able to now support their family and, um, and do this. But, but yeah, we never really, it's usually like a friend who's like, you guys are so lucky that you have this flexible, you know, you're able to do this with your time or you're able to do that or, um, but yeah, we don't ever actively appreciate no we don't stop and smell the roses when you own your own small business you don't stop and smell no, the roses roses don't exist no but, they don't yeah. but you smell the soap um 
But yeah, like in our office, there's a picture of us in a magazine or like Microsoft featured us in like an ad campaign. Like we, we, were, on we, we were on a billboard on the side of the Staples Center. Like that's crazy. And they put it up on our 20th anniversary. We were like, what the hell? Like this is crazy. We never. So I think when you set out with zero expectations, like it's double edged. Like you, you don't celebrate meeting goals because you kind of don't even set them. But you also are happy with everything that you get because you had no expectations. Right. So, um, yeah. Set the bar low and you'll never be dissatisfied. <laughs> right, yeah. There you yeah. go. <laughs> Words of wisdom. Yeah. Hopefully my wife doesn't feel that way about <laughs> me. <laughs> um, what, uh, is there any advice that you would give anybody who's looking to start a business and or any, any advice about just upstart in general? Uh, I would, my advice would be don't, well, I guess it depends on how old you are, but I just, I think do it the way you're comfortable. Don't spend every last penny and think that you're a hero for suffering through starting a business. Like be smart. If you have to have a second job, there's no shame in that. Just don't like, don't blow it all on your idea as amazing as it might be. Just be slow and smart, and that would what my advice would be. Well, I mean, but it depends on what kind of person you are. For me personally, it was kind of tr like if just basic business um, strategy or whatever, try to find a market that exists or try to find something that – I remember one teacher of mine when I was growing up who I thought was a total fool, but – um he wasn't, I was the fool, but he would, you know, he would say things that we go, you know, if you do, if you find something to do that nobody else wants to do and you do it better than them, you'll make a lot of money. And, um, that doesn't necessarily apply to our business, but I think the lesson there kind of was, was sort of what he was trying to tell us was find something that people need, you know, find something that people, you know, and to what we do, selling soap, you know, there's tons of soap companies that are out there already. So people don't necessarily need another soap company. Um, but what we did, we tried to do before kind of becoming fully full time and fully invested in it was seeing if we could sell some soap, you know, and to go, Hey, uh, uh, yeah, restaurants need soap. And this is maybe sort of a cool idea and maybe they'll like it. And before kind of going 100% in and, you know, we, we, we were in, we were, but before kind of, you know, spending all our life savings or whatever, we tried to see if we could sell some of it first. Sure. Um, so, yeah, my advice to people would be, yeah, definitely try to find a, a market, you know, for a product, something, a service, whatever it is. Find out if this is something that people actually need or want and then try to do it on a small scale. And then if you can do it on a small scale, try to try to expand. Yeah, sure. That's uh, that's all sound advice, I think. Uh, outside of the business, um, what kind of hobbies are you guys into aside from attending lacrosse games? Um, I mean, we work a lot, so there's not a ton of time for hobbies. But I like to play golf. Uh, Wyatt likes to mountain bike, so we, I take him out on the mountain bike. Uh, I like to exercise. Where do you guys ride? Uh, we ride. Um, in Cherry Canyon, which is in La Cañada, we go near the JPL in Pasadena. Yeah, I used to ride those trails. Yep. Those are um, fun. Yeah, and we went up to Arrowhead last weekend, which was fun, at the Sky, Santa's Village, which is Sky Park or something, but that was a cool spot. Now, are you guys really into it? Are you riding full suspension, cross-country mm -hmm. bikes? Like Why it is, I, have, I had an older bike that had no suspension, but my friend um, sold me his nicer mountain bike for I think a hundred bucks or something. So. Nice. But Wyatt's got one of those nice tricked out bikes. That's, but uh, yeah, he's much more into it than I am. I, I admittedly just kind of go cause he likes to do it. I don't, I wouldn't necessarily pick that as my number one thing just cause to get good at mountain biking, you have to fall down and crash a lot. So I don't want to hurt myself. So I go very slowly. I look like I'm 500 years old on the bike. Well, riding a bike with no suspension was a good way to start to get beat up, I would say. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so golf, where do you have your go-to tracks for golf? 
Um, we have yeah, a couple of friends that I play with or some other guys, but we usually take, we've got part of a group now where we'll take different trips uh, to go with different trips around the area. Um, we went to, um, what was it called last spring? Borrego Springs, um, which had a nice, great course down there. Like playing Rustic Canyon. Oh, yeah. And then, um, yeah, whatever, sometimes. Brookside, like playing there, whatever. Any place that'll, you know, that'll, that we can play, we'll go play. He still plays ice hockey, too. Oh, that's awesome. That and the mountain biking. He The reason he goes slow and the reason he's no longer playing goalie is because, like, our work is fairly physical. And so he literally, we can't afford him to hurt himself. So he, uh, <laughs> whenever Wyatt complains, Dad goes so slow. I'm like, that's what pays for you to be able to go up. Right, so right. Um, let him go slow. That's but yeah, funny. Wyatt's way into mountain biking. Um, what are you into? I am the crazy volunteer lady. I And I am particularly obsessed with public education. Well, that doesn't sound crazy at all. So, well, so I was... Um, just the president of our local school foundation, um, our school district foundation here in town in South Pasadena. And um, that was like a part-time job for a couple of years, but it was volunteer. Um, but yeah, right now I'm sort of, I did that. I was in that group for six years, but I was, you know, I was always the room mom and always this and that. And now why it will start high school next year. And it's very uncool to have your parents, you know, anywhere near any of that. So I'm sort of, um, getting more involved with Planned Parenthood right now. Um, and so I, I think I'm going to keep busy. Um, you know, I hang out with my friends, I go hiking, I do all that kind of stuff, but, um, I am focused on, um, equal rights for people. Right. <laughs> and sure. <public> yeah. School. <laughs> yeah. Just now, little are things like that. Are your folks still in Point Loma? Do you guys My ever... mom's in Point Loma. Yeah. She's in the same house I grew up in. Um, my dad and my stepmom live in uh, Orange County. But um, yeah, Sunset Cliffs. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 92107. That's right. <laughs> That's where I grew up. Um, and Marshall, are they still in Connecticut? Uh, my mom, yes. My dad passed away about oosh, almost eight, nine years ago, something like that. My mom, my both my parents were remarried. So my ma, stepmom lives in South Carolina. My mom lives in um, Connecticut. Um, and then... Uh, yeah. So, and my brother and sister are still there too. Oh, same cool. Hometown so, do you make it back to the East Coast? At least once a year, sometimes twice. That's awesome. Well, listen, guys, I can't thank you enough for for taking part. I really appreciate you dedicating the time. Thank you very much. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. This counts as one of those opportunities where we appreciate. That's right. Our business. So, yeah. thank you for <laughs> well, allowing funny, us lo- this moment. A lot of people have talked about actually usually after I hit record yeah. or, or stop, they, they will talk about, in fact, like I haven't reflected like this in years. Like I'm, yeah. your questions are crazy. Like to think about my childhood and stuff like that. So, yeah. I mean, we developed our first label on, I think like PowerPoint or like, I don't know what it was, but I was like, use the courier font. I mean, it was just the two of us, like me leaning over a shoulder and just like playing around with things. And now we have this like, beautiful label that comes to us in rolls of 500 that we blow through. And, um, yeah, I mean, I used to hand glue all the labels on all the candles and hand pour. Like we have a filling machine. Like you kind of forget, like we used to hand pour every single bottle that would go out to retailers. Like, I mean, my shoulder's probably going to go out one day just as a result of those few years of torture. But yeah, it's nice to sit and reflect. So, so, so what is the font, by the way? I don't. What's the name of the? It, does of it have the, a name, or was it created? Uh, uh, it was created for us. It was a, a special font that somebody created. Oh, cool! So it's yeah. further. the further font. <laughs> the, the further font. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks again. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Appreciate okay. You. Thank See you. Ya. Big thanks to Megan and Marshall again for taking the time, and all of you should definitely get on board with their soaps, etc. It's really great stuff. As always, shout out to Clear Audio for the headphones as well as to Jensen Reed and Super Beautiful for the theme music. I'll catch you guys next week.